Well, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right in. Father, we're so thankful again for this equipping hour, and we thank you that we can gather as your church and think soberly about what it means to fear you, and particularly what it means to fear you as, as parents and to fear you in the home. Lord, as we saw last week, if, uh, if we were to labor tirelessly to build a home that would be honoring to you, it would all be vain unless you built it. Uh, we, we, when we talk about fearing you in parenting, and especially if we talk about successful or faithful parenting, this is something that we cannot do on our own. Um, and so every, every one of us this morning cries out to you for help so that we could fear you rightly. And thank you for giving us all the resources we need to fear you rightly in your word. Um, so this morning, Lord, I just pray that this, um, this study would be uh, an encouragement and a help, as well as a, a confrontation, um, uh, a reorientation maybe, for, as we think about um, our parenting, as we think about our relationship with our children, um, most importantly, as we think about our relationship with you as it regards our parenting. And so, Lord, um, help us to take the fear of you, to appropriate it in our own lives, to grow in it, to pursue it, and to apply it so that our parenting and our grandparenting and our encouragement of one another in the body would be rooted and established in the fear of you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we looked at what it means to fear the Lord, and um, particularly uh, as we start talking about the fear of the Lord in the home, we looked last week ex pretty, pretty particularly in marriage. And this morning I want to take that same topic and I want to apply that to parenting and uh, being a parent and being a child. Both, it's a, it's a two-way two -way street, it's a two-way relationship. And I want to look at what, that would, what the scriptures say about fearing the Lord as a parent. If you want to grab your Bibles, let's go back to Psalm 127 and 128, which are a very helpful place to start. We looked at these Psalms last week and launched from there into the discussion of marriage, and we're going to do the same this week and launch into the discussion of parenting. Psalm 127, Solomon writes, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved, even in his sleep. And we could, of course, apply that principle to about anything. It would be vain to uh, pull up all of your efforts and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps to become a self-made individual in the professional world. But that, of course, is going to be vain, apart from the Lord giving you success. But specifically, Solomon has in mind the home, and that's exactly where he goes in verse 3. Behold, the children, they are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. And there's a blessing, there's a strength, and there's a privilege that comes to those who get to see the fruit of their labors in the next generation. But again, all of those labors are null and vain apart from God being the one who builds or God being the one who guards and watches. So there's no protection apart from the Lord. There's no um, building up apart from the Lord. And then in Psalm 128, most likely also written by Solomon, verse 1, how blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And you can see the refrain again in verse 4, behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. And so fear of the Lord bookend this entire stanza, and in the middle of it, he describes explicitly this man's relationship with his wife and then with his children. When, verse 2, when you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. And then it goes on to talk about the blessing of the Lord and the prosperity that comes from the Lord when you fear the Lord. I think it's just very easy 
to think about my parenting, I know for me it's, this is the case, it's very easy, it's all too easy to think about my parenting, and to evaluate my parenting based upon how things are going. <laughs> Just take a little survey of the circumstance and look at, look at how, how the behavior is, is going and who are they hanging out with and who are the friends and are they making good decisions. And, and then you can actually, unfortunately, have a very positive view of negligent parenting or you could have a very negligent, negative view of positive parenting. Because, of course, the externals and what you can measure is, is not the full sum of it. I think when I think about parenting as a, as a, as a, as a young married man, before I even had children, um, I, I would even imagine, like, what, if we had kids, what would they grow up and do? What would they grow up and be? And it would just... It was amazing as, as, I, as God granted us four boys that we love and that we cherish and, and, and we, we just counted the greatest privilege to, to, to pray for, to, to strive to instruct and to care for. I mean, that, that labor is a privilege, but the unknown of it all has exposed that so much of that daydreaming about parenting was very selfish and it wasn't even rooted in the fear of the Lord. I think... Um, what, the picture that needs to be in our mind as we think about our parenting and combining our parenting with the fear of the Lord ought to, it should not be current at all. It shouldn't be circumstantial at all. It shouldn't be external at all. In fact, it shouldn't even be future and external or future and behavioral. It should be far future, standing before the Lord as parents giving an account for our parenting. Not the status of their relationship with Christ, not their success in the world, none of those things matter at that point. Standing before the Lord, giving an account for our parenting is the picture that must be in our minds if we're going to connect the fear of the Lord to our parenting. And standing before God when God says, all right, how about your parenting? How'd you do? Because suddenly, all those externals don't really matter. Those externals are out of our hands. Uh, the externals don't tell the story. What tells the story at that point is winning the battle in the inner man as a father or as a mother so that the most important thing in our parenting is that God would be pleased. And I, I, can't, I can't tell you how, how common this is um, I mean, and, and this, is, this is just common when I'm trying to encourage other parents. This is common when I'm trying to encourage my own wife. This is common when I'm trying to encourage myself in parenting. Uh, I've told April so many times, our boys, their, their greatest need is a sanctified dad and a sanctified mom. The greatest contribution we can bring to the parenting um, table is our own holiness, our own sanctification. You say, but that might not be enough. Well, enough for what? To please God or to get the circumstances that we want? Enough for what? And so it keeps going back to all of our issues when it comes to parenting, all the practical issues and the conversations we could have about practical outworkings and how we do things and all of those discussions, those are important. But it all comes back to, is it enough for us as parents to simply be pleasing to Christ. That's really it. I mean, that is, you know, you can hear, I'm just saying the same thing over and over, no matter what the topic. It's just, that's it. Fear of the Lord. Do, are we content to be pleasing to Christ? There's nothing else that matters when it comes to our parenting than that we would be content to be pleasing to the Lord. And if that governs our heart and if that governs our lives, well, then everything else will take care of itself. In our heart of hearts, are we winning the battle? Are we winning the battle to please Christ and not ourselves? Are we winning the battle to obey the Lord? And You know, I just remember thinking of uh, the Proverbs. You know, uh, Proverbs would come to mind as I was a young dad and I would come home from work and, and there I am with, you know, four boys in grade school or even younger and just... You know, April's even t more tired than I am. She's been raising four bo boys all day. I've been working. I come home, and I'm just like, oh, okay, good. I just want to sit down on the sofa and put on my feet and read a good book or just relax, do something. And uh, then all of a sudden, something's happening that's going to require some attention. Oh. 
All of a sudden, the inner monologue starts working, doesn't it? Oh, man, does this, do I really need to deal with that? Do we really have to do this right now? Does that need attention right now? Do not withhold the rod or you hate your son comes to mind. <laughs> and there I am. I remember, I remember this one very particularly. I was just sitting on the sofa just thinking like preaching that verse to myself. Wow. If I do nothing right now, that, has, that is the opposite of loving my child. That is the epitome of loving myself. It just had to preach to myself. I literally just had to preach to myself. It was a moment of potential neglect. Fear God and go love your son. <laughs> fear God and go love your son. The fear of the Lord is, is critical. And it's just amazing how circumstances in parenting will bring out all of the ways that we don't fear the Lord, where we don't fear the Lord enough, or we don't fear the Lord at all. What I want to do this morning is I'm going to grab a few examples from the Old Testament of parenting. Um, and and we've got a few contrary examples, actually. And these are helpful because they can, in the negative example, we can see the divine commentary on what went wrong with the, these uh, um, aspects of parenting. And that becomes a help to us to think about what does it practically look like to put on the fear of the Lord as a father or as a mother. So as a parent, what does it look like to put on the fear of the Lord? So let's start with the example of Eli. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to look at the example of Eli. And this is, is one of all three of these examples we're going to look at are negative examples. Eli was uh, the, the prophet, and you're, 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 you're familiar with his story because obviously Hannah was barren, and then God gave her a son, and so she dedicated him to the temple, and that, that was, of course, Samuel. And Samuel goes and lives with Eli in the temple. Now, or I should say in the, in the, in the tabernacle at that point, but let's pick it up with the story. Let's pick up the story after Hannah, and we're going to pick it up with Eli and his biological sons in chapter 2, verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Notice what it says. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They didn't know the Lord and the custom of the priests with the people. The divine commentary gives us a little bit of information that we need to make sense of this story that we're about to read because it just starts out by saying... Flat out, Eli's sons were worthless. And if you are questioning what it means to be a worthless, and notice in the NAS footnote there, the sons of Belial, if you want to know what it means to be a son of Belial, uh, a worthless son, it describes it this way. They didn't know the Lord or the custom of the priests. They are ignorant of God and his person and the practice of the priests in the tabernacle. And they are priests. This is tragic commentary on Eli's sons. And so listen to what happens in verse 13. When any man was offering the sacrifice, the priest's servants would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. So remember, we are in the period of the tabernacle. God's presence dwells in Shiloh. It has not yet been moved to Jerusalem and let alone even build the permanent temple under Solomon. This is all before that. So in Shiloh at the tabernacle, Eli's sons are functioning in that fashion. And you might, you might not, you know, you might read that and say, well, what's, what's the problem here? We'll continue reading verse 15. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, they must surely burn the fat first and then take as much as you desire, then he would say, no, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I'll take it by force. What's being described here is an absolute violation of Levitical law. The sons of, of Eli are taking the sacrifices. Now, what's, what's prescribed in, in Leviticus is that the Levites would actually make their living off of the sacrificial system. So the tithe, that goes to pay for the, 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 the temple, and it goes to subsidize the, the living of all the Levites. They don't even have their own land. 
They lived in the cities of the other 12 tribes and then would go up to the temple and serve for months at a time. And so what would happen is the tithe offering is part of the way to to pay for a theocracy when the Levitical tribe doesn't even have land to farm and to provide for themselves. One of the ways that they lived uh, off of uh, the nation was the sacrifices that would be brought to the temple for the Lord would actually be the food for the Levites and their families. But there were strict laws about what they could and couldn't eat. What's happening here is they don't want to give a sin offering and a burnt offering first, and the choice offerings going to the Lord. The equivalent might be to say, why does the Lord get the the prime rib and we get the chuck roast or whatever, whatever the equivalent would be. They're complaining about the cut prescribed, and so they're actually violating Leviticus to take the sacrifice from the offerer by force, and supposing that this is a God-fearing worshiper, he might even have a problem with it and say, wait a minute, why aren't you obeying the Lord and obeying his word? And they're like, shut your mouth, give us your sacrifice, we're going to take it by force. And then it didn't matter how it was supposed to be offered to the Lord. They would take the cut of their own choice. They wouldn't even boil it. They want to do it however they want, to flavor it however they want. They want to leave all the fat in because it tasted better. It had nothing to do with the fear of Yahweh. Verse 17. Thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. I mean, you think about it. These boys, sons of Eli, they should be functioning at the tabernacle thinking this is the location of the presence of Yahweh on earth. He's dwelling among us. We got, they should be on pins and needles. We got to do everything exactly as the Lord has demanded. He's the only one who knows what successful worship actually looks like. How dare we do anything different? But these young men, they're not gripped by the fear of the Lord. They're gripped by their bellies. They're driven on by their sensual appetites. Sensual both by their physical appetite and their sexual appetite, as the next story makes clear. Skip over to chapter 2, verse 22. We are, and again, we are skipping a little bit of the story of Hannah and Samuel, which is interwoven with Eli and his children. We're just looking at Eli's example right now. Verse 22, now, Eli was very old, and he heard all his, that his sons were doing to Israel, how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And so uh, their, their, their sensuality is in every uh, facet. You, know, you can't compartmentalize sin, of course, and so it doesn't matter if it comes to their, 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 their physical appetite or their, or their sexual appetite here. This is one, though, that Eli is sensitive to. And so Eli attempts to take a, a mild rebuke and give it to his boys. Verse 23, he said to them, Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? Now, let's just stop right there for a second. If if that's all you had, if that was all that you read in thinking about this as a father, you might think, well, that's that's a good rebuke. The rebuke points the boys back to the fact that what they're doing is wrong. The rebuke points out that if you sin against the Lord, where could you possibly go? So far, so good. It sounds like a a decent rebuke, but we're going to have to pay attention to the story because this is actually not a good rebuke, not because of something that he said, but because of something he did not do and something he actually did do. It's his example that makes this rebuke worthless. It's a toothless rebuke. There's no teeth in it because of Eli's negative example. So pick it up in verse 25b. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Wow. These boys are worthless. They get a 
a good biblical rebuke from their dad. If their dad's example would have been one of a man who feared the Lord, this very same rebuke would be actually a good rebuke. There's nothing wrong with the words that Eli said. What's wrong is that it didn't have teeth because of his life. For example, if Eli really had teeth to this rebuke, let alone what happened in the first story um, about the sacrifices being abused, if he had enough conviction here, he should have just said, sons, you're done. Get out of the tabernacle. This is over. You cannot serve in this capacity. The Lord does not deserve to have to put up with this kind of behavior. But no, he just says, hey, it's bad. Please stop. Cut it out, won't you? And does nothing. Verse 26, now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and favor both with the Lord and with men, quite opposite to his, Eli's sons. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, did I not reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose them with all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people, Israel. Wow. Verse 29 turns everything on its head for Eli. If you imagine that Eli's rebuke was solid on firm ground, think again. Verse 29 reveals that this son of, this, um, uh, this prophet, this man of God, comes to Eli with this message and he rebukes Eli for violating the Levitical system. Notice what was lacking in the story was a rebuke and a refusal to participate in his own son's compromise with regard to the offerings. This verse actually says, why do you honor your sons above me? They've, he's put his sons as more important in his own life, in his own parenting. His, the significance of his children has now trans, transcended God himself to the point that Eli himself is compromising because this man of God says, you are making yourselves, plural, addressing Eli, fat with the choicest of every offering. The sons were disobeying the Lord. And, of course, Eli is in the same home. And they come home with an abundance of prime rib and T-bone and New York strip. And he's used to eating the, the old, you know, the, 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 the stew meat. Oh, that's pretty good stuff. Man, I don't know, that's not right, but he didn't say anything. There's an absence of rebuke in verses 12 to 17, coupled with verse 29 now, the explicit, the explicit exposure that Eli was indeed involved in the compromise. Now, when you get to verse 29, you can go back to the rebuke about his sons being profligate immoral men and you realize how empty that rebuke really is. It has no teeth to it because Eli is already a compromiser. He's already demonstrated that he has raised his sons above God, that he is esteeming his own children above God. And now all of a sudden, to pull a 180 and say, oh, but in this area, it looks really bad what you're doing. Cut it out, guys while he continues to compromise in this area with his sons? You know, it's just interesting. We obviously have no, mere mortals have no ability to regenerate a soul. You know, the regeneration of your children is entirely 
a work of the living God. And so, here with Eli and his sons, you, you walk away from this story and you think, well, okay, his sons are just worthless men whom the Lord desired to put to death so they wouldn't listen to a godly rebuke. But then on further review, you realize that Eli is not giving godly rebukes. He's giving half-hearted, witless, compromising rebukes, wanting to live how he wants to live, not fearing the Lord in his own life. And so suddenly, calling his children to fear the Lord is an empty endeavor because he himself is not fearing the Lord. This is the kind of long-standing hypocrisy that is impossible to overcome. It's impossible to overcome. And I don't mean that the Lord can't save somebody out of a home of rampant, gross hypocrisy. Of course he does. He, He does that. But I'm talking about to you as parents, to us as parents, we as parents will not be able to overcome as far as our own accountability for our parenting, we will not be able to overcome a lifestyle of hypocrisy, not fearing the Lord. We must fear the Lord. This is exactly what Eli did. The story continues. In chapter 3, verse 10, the Lord comes and he stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak. So again, we're jumping into the story with Samuel, but God called Samuel three times, and, and he went and looked at Eli and said, hey, what are, you, are you calling me? And he's like, no, I didn't call you. Go, go back. And finally he said, I think it's the Lord. Go listen. So now we pick up the third time God calls Samuel, and he's going to give us a message about Eli. And so listen to this. This is helpful for us understanding as, as, a, as a negative example, Eli's parenting. Verse 11, the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Okay, so... God is speaking directly to Samuel in prophetic fashion now. Samuel's getting direct revelation. And God says, Eli did not rebuke them. But wait a minute, didn't the story say? Back in verse 23 to 25, didn't Eli say, no, my sons, don't do this thing? There's the divine commentary. A life of parenting that's not characterized by the fear of the Lord, we might offer up and we might throw out an occasional biblical sounding rebuke but God's divine commentary on that that's not a rebuke our lives must first be a rebuke before our words so God can actually say in 313 Eli did not rebuke his sons he continues speaking to Samuel verse 14 therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Then Samuel lays down, and he was afraid, verse 15b, to tell the vision to Eli. And the uh, next day he calls him, and verse 17, what's the word that he spoke to you? Please don't hide it from me. May the Lord do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me, of all the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Sounds like the resignation of a man who still refuses to rebuke his sons. Of course, you probably remember how this story ends. Chapter 4, verse 10. So the Philistines fought against the fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent, and the slaughter was very great. For there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. 
Now a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And when he came, behold, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road, eagerly watching, because his heart was trembling for the ark of God. So the man came to, to, tell, to tell it in the city, and all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the noise of this commotion mean? Then the man came hurriedly and told Eli. Verse 15. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. The man said to Eli, I am the one who came from the battle line. Indeed, I escaped from the battle line today. And he said, he said to him, How did things go, my son? Then the one who brought the news replied, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there also has been a great slaughter among the people, and your, son, your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been taken. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backward beside the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for he was old and heavy. Thus he judged Israel forty years. Verse 19, his, father, his daughter-in-law, sorry, his daughter-in-law Phineas' wife was pregnant, about to give birth. When she heard the news that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband had died, she knelt down and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. About the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have given birth to a son. But she didn't answer or pay attention. And she called the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law, and because of her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God was taken. Thus ends the story of Eli and his family. It's a tragic story. It's a tragic story, but we learn so much because we realize that we would be remiss to have a, at times, helpful and edifying conversation about the nitty-gritty of training up children, instructing them, even correcting without having the foundational conversation about it doesn't matter what you say if your life is one marked of compromise to the fear of the Lord. We must fear the Lord. I mean, this is just critical. Let me give you another example. Connected to Eli, the example of Samuel. Obviously, Eli had two sons who were worthless, and then he had this adopted son, if you will, Samuel, who, for all intents and purposes, he raised in the service of the Lord. I want to skip over to the story of Samuel with his own children in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel is a a hero in um, pretty much every area of his life with this notable exception. Chapter 8. It came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abijah and they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. I mean, think about it. I mean, the apple not falling far from the tree. I mean, this is almost the exact same pattern that was laid out for him by Eli with Hophni and Phinehas. Because now Samuel's sons are walking in dishonest gain. They're pursuing dishonest gain. They're taking bribes. They're perverting justice. They are abusing their position of authority for selfish gain. And now, if that's the character of these boys, what in the world is Samuel doing appointing them judges over Israel? Verse 4, All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Look, you've grown old and your sons do not walk in your ways. I mean, it was clear. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew the character of these, of these boys of, of Samuel. They don't walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. Now obviously, you know well that the nations rebuked for their lust for a king just to be like the other nations. God had made provisions for a king in the Torah and that was his plan all along. But the problem here is that this is motivated by envy and just um, selfish desire to be like the nations. And it's actually a, a lack of trust in the Lord. But the problem with, with, 
with, with for Samuel is that it was a rejection of his boys. He should never have appointed his boys in the first place. They shouldn't even have been judges. And he should have confronted his boys. He should have removed them from office if he didn't know about their character beforehand. If he did, he should never, never put them there in the first place. But it's actually just kind of fascinating to see how direct the parallel is between Eli's parenting and Samuel's. Remember the rebuke from the man of God in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29, is you have raised your sons above me. You've esteemed them more highly than me. Parents, think about this. Your exclusive allegiance and loyalty must be to the Lord. You, your children must be loved enough to know that their commitment to pursue the world is something that you have no tolerance for. Both Eli and Samuel exalted their children above the Lord. And of course, that wasn't characteristic of Samuel, but it was true of him in this story. And so that becomes a very important warning for us. Let's look at one more example. We have time for one more example, and this comes from the example of David, King David himself. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. David, like Samuel, was a godly man, a man who feared the Lord, a man who, whose, whose heart longed to please Yahweh. But here's a story, much like Samuel, here's a story that was out of character for him. And here we see his parenting, and in his parenting we see a very significant problem. Chapter 1, verse 1. King David was old, advanced in age, and they covered him with clothes, and he could not keep warm. And so, skip down to verse 5. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I'll be king. So as David is dying, and he's old, and he's about to pass off the scene... Adonijah says, well, now's my chance. I'm, this, I'm a son of David. I should be the next king. And so he takes it into his own hands. He prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with 50 men to run before him. Now, he's already, David's already made it clear that Solomon's going to be king. And Bathsheba knows that. Solomon knows that. It seems like Adonijah knows that because he prepares with haste and he sets this thing up super fast. But verse 6 is very fascinating. It's not an action point in the story. It, it's not the next scene. It's simply theological commentary so that you can make sense of the story. And it's important for the author to say, his father had never crossed him at any time by asking, why have you done so? Now, that's a fascinating, I mean, you're talking about, you're telling a story about the king on his deathbed and his son trying to take over the throne, and you just throw that out there? Now, by the way, let me explain to you about David's parenting. He actually never crossed this son. And notice the nature of the question, why have you done so? It's a question about motive, the motives behind an action. David is now being exposed as a dad who, with this particular son, Adonijah at least, he has not made a habit of asking him, son, now why did you do that? What are the motives here? And that's not all. We haven't reached the end of these seemingly apparent, out of position commentary for the point of this story. Verse 6 continues on. And he was also a very handsome man. Okay? And he was born after Absalom. Okay, all three of these details are put at this particular point in the story so that we can understand the story, we can make better sense of the story, and we can appreciate why Adonijah is doing what he's doing. Verse 7, after he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and following Abiath uh, sorry, Adonijah, they helped him. So he starts a coup, and he gets some major players from the palace and from the temple to help him and then it goes on to um, describe how he starts offering sacrifices and basically makes himself king. But then in verses 11 and following, 
um, how David and Nathan and Bathsheba make sure and put, put Solomon on the throne. But let's go back to our strange theological parenthetical statement in verse 6. You know, it's one thing to rebel against a parent because a child's just, you know, my parents, I mean, they, they lived a long time ago. They don't know what it's like to be a teenager. And I get it. I get it. Oh, yeah, because all parents, you know, were born at the age of 20, right? So we wouldn't know. But yeah, again, that's beside the point. I can appreciate the fact that understanding, um, you know what, there's a challenge here. There's a temptation here. But you, 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 you're not quite understanding the story if you think that that's all there is to a rebellion against your dad when your dad is King David. Rebellion against King David and his line is a rebellion against God's redemptive purposes through the seed promise that have come out, starting with Eve all the way now through King David himself. So for Adonijah to just throw off the secession of who's going to be king next and say, it's going to be me is the greatest act of unbelief Adonijah could commit. This is more than just a grumpy young man who's tired of his dad's rules. This is a rejection of God's promised seed line. So the author takes the time to explain to, to the reader as we read this part of the problem. Part of the problem is his dad never crossed him. That was tragic. David, he owed it to Adonijah. Unless Adonijah is glorified, he's, there's going to be times where he needs to be crossed. And so unless your children are glorified, <laughs> there's going to be times where they need to be crossed. Not sinned against with anger or hostility, but crossed in the sense of right here. Asking questions about motive. Now, why did you do that? Let's just examine the motives here for a second. Because is Christ reigning in your heart? Are you motivated by pleasing the Lord? Asking questions about motive are critical. But these other two comments are maybe not quite so obvious as to why they contribute to Adonijah rebelling against King David. He was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. And so the author makes the point to show, hey, this guy, he, he's got a lot going for him. Things seem to go his way. He's probably used to getting his way. He's probably pretty popular with all of his friends. What's interesting, not just about the fact that he might have stood out with his, by his looks, what's also interesting is that the, the, the author makes the point to show that he was also born after Absalom. Now, why is that significant? Well, all we have to do is replay it in our mind, the story of Absalom. Absalom was the one who committed the coup. He led the coup back in uh, 2 Samuel, the coup against David. And so when Absalom you know, dies, he is beside himself, miserable. Why was David so miserable when Absalom died? I mean, he was his enemy, his personal enemy, because he loved Abs Absalom. And he knew, without any question, he knew that Absalom's death meant immediate judgment because he died in rebellion against the seed line, the son of David, David himself. So, you can put two and two together here. David does not want another Absalom on his hands. That would be obvious, right? I think that's natural. We all, we all got to agree if you're David and Absalom dies in unbelief, you don't want another Absalom going against you, rebelling against you. That's not something we can control, though. David takes matters into his own hands to say, I am not going to be on bad terms with Adonijah. I am not going to have another Absalom on my hands. Why? Because it's too painful as a dad. too painful. You can see the motivation here. The motivation for David not to cross his son Adonijah is, let's just be honest, self-love. It's too painful. I don't want to experience that again. 
I don't want to go back down that road. I'm going to do whatever it takes to avoid that. And that becomes a little idle in our parenting. It's going to prevent us from being faithful in our parenting. I admit this is a challenging place to be. Looking at these examples, one unfaithful example, um, two faithful examples at their worst <laughs> in a chapter where they, where they were not successful, where they were not faithful. And I realize it's challenging as a parent then to think about this, all that we're up against. The challenges to our parenting are not our, our children, are they? It's right here. This is the challenge to our parenting. You know, if I just asked you, do you show preference for your kids over God? Do you love your kids more than God? It's a challenging question. You think, well, is that really, does it have to be at odds? Can't I love God by loving my kids? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's absolutely true, but we've got to make sure that we define love biblically. So as parents, let's do that real quick. We got, we got a few minutes here, so look at 1 John for a second. Look at 1 John. As a parent, if I'm thinking about what does it mean to fear God, what does it mean to be consumed with pleasing God in my parenting, does that make me indifferent to what is best for my children? Never. By fearing God, you are giving your children what's best. You cannot improve on being a loving parent than by fearing God and fearing God exclusively. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, let's look at these two verses. We know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. How do I know if I actually love my children as a parent? How do I know that I actually love my children? How would I know that I'm loving them biblically versus how would I know that I'm loving them like David loved Adonijah and I'm calling it love, but it's actually motivated by self-love rooted in a fear of having to go back to a painful experience as a parent? How would I know the difference? Well, verse 2 says... Here's how you would know that you love the children of God. If you're really going to love, how about your own biological children? How do you know that you really love your own biological children? You are never more loving to your own biological children than when you love God and observe his commandments. There's nothing more loving than that. You cannot love your children more than by loving God and observing his commandments. And then he explains, because this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Keeping God's commandments and his commandments not being burdensome is actually the definition of love for God. Notice, by the way, it doesn't say that his commandments are easy. It just says that they're not a burden. So the issue is not that, oh, I'll obey if I don't, it doesn't cost me anything. That's not, that's not obedience. But it's not a burden in the sense that when you love God, it's actually what you prefer. It's like, oh, wow, that's, that's very costly. But, man, I love God and I'm going to obey. That's what it means to love your children. That's how you'll know the difference between loving your children in a godly way versus loving your children in the way that David loved them. Uh, yeah, I love my kids. In fact, I love them so much, I'm never going to let that happen again, and so I'm not going to cross him. And By this, you know that you don't love the, <laughs> your brethren. When you love yourself and you're idolatrously consumed with fear of going back to a painful, hurtful scenario and you don't want to experience it again. And so this fear of God, as you can see, just touches everything. It touches everything. I just want to end by kind of describing for you uh, a rubric. A, um, maybe that's not the right word, but at least two lists here. I'm going to give you a list of what it looks like in parenting to, um, to fear man and then to fear God. And, and maybe what's helpful, the way, I, the way I wrote this out is I just thought it was at, uh, you know, uh, uh, helpful at times to see what 
failure looks like if you're motivated by the fear of man and what success looks like if you're motivated by the fear of man. And then on the flip side, to let the fear of God be the governing impulse and to say, what does success in my parenting look like if I fear God? And what does failure look like if I'm fearing God? So let's start with the fear of man. As, and I, again, I'm just talking about his parents. If I'm fearing man as a parent, um, which would become the example then of um, Eli, Samuel in, that, in chapter 8, and David in 1 Kings 1. What does failure look like if I'm governed, gripped by the fear of man? Well, my child's disobedience. Suddenly, an, an act of disobedience on the part of my children, that's, that's failure. Oh, man, we've got to stop that. We can't, they can't disobey because that, that reflects poorly on me. <laughs> Oh, man, this is, oh, whoa, what's that going to look like? Oh, this doesn't look good. And so suddenly the act of disobedience on the part of my children is failure if I'm fearing man. Or like I mentioned in my first example, uh, when I was particularly tired and selfish and not wanting to obey and I had to uh, just preach to myself to obey and fear the Lord, um, Failure could be anything that demands my attention or derails my productivity, right? That's failure. I remember one time we were working on a a remodel uh, at our our house uh, back in Florida, and so we had dug a a main. We had put a new a new sewer line from one end of the house back to our our, uh, the main going back out by the easement. So I had this massive trench that we had we had chipped out from down the driveway and went across the front yard and. And, uh, you know, it was super deep because of whatever, because of the slope of the plumbing that it had to meet to, to pass inspection. And so this trench is extremely deep. And if you know anything about dirt, <laughs> soil in Florida, it's all sand. I mean, it's just one big sandy island. That's all it is. And uh, so, you know, you dig out this trench. To get down like three feet means you have to dig like three feet wide because it's just like 45 degree angle of sand. It's just, it's just worthless. So we have these massive trenches in our yard. And I remember one time um, I couldn't find my keys, and I found out one of the boys was playing with my keys, and they were all very young, um, and so they were playing with my keys, so it gets lost in some, like, 40-foot trench of sand all the way across our property, and so I was just so frustrated. There I am. Oh, I cannot believe, like, it's, it's, oh, we got, we got an inspector coming. We're supposed to make some progress. We've got to knock this project out. we got to... The fear of man, if I'm governed by the fear of man, then that's failure. My, my children's disobedience is failure. Anything that complicates my life is failure. Anything that I don't want to happen is failure. On the flip side, if I'm governed by the fear of man, here's what success looks like. Successful behavior. My kids just, just do what they're supposed to do. Man, that looks good. Other people praise you about your children. You're like, yeah, that's right. That's right. You know who their dad is. (laughs) Or we might even get, I wouldn't wouldn't expect any of us to go here, but you might even start comparing your children with other children. Fear of man is going to do all sorts of wicked and corrupt things to your parenting. Success and failure, neither one are properly defined, and they're completely misconstrued, and both are idolatrous. What about fear of God? If I'm governed by the fear of God, what's that going to look like? If I'm governed by the fear of God, you know what failure is? Failure is not my children's disobedience. Failure is my disobedience. Suddenly, the whole enterprise of parenting becomes concerned about what if the Lord were dishonored by the parent? What if the Lord were dishonored by me? (laughs) Suddenly that becomes everything in parenting. Because now, if I'm governed by the fear of the Lord, my my children's disobedience isn't a threat. That that does not force me to be displeasing to the Lord. My children's disobedience becomes an opportunity to worship the Lord and love my child. To shepherd them, instruct them, help them, open up God's word. It just becomes another opportunity to worship Him. And so failure becomes my disobedience my compromise. Failure would be any lack of conformity to my role in the parenting. Maybe you have, maybe you have a shared parenting with your spouse, or maybe you're parenting um, by yourself, or, or maybe you have a spouse who doesn't love the Lord. Um, in any of those, compli- any of those um, um, scenarios, any of those combinations, 
failure would be to fail in your role. If you're gripped by the fear of the Lord, that would be failure. Your own disobedience, your own compromise, your own um, lack of conformity to your role. How about success? Success would be defined as obeying the Lord in any and every circumstance. Suddenly success is, is not getting to the end of the day with this kind of behavior. Whew, okay, I didn't have to deal with it. Success is, yeah, don't know what behavior I'm going to face today. But success would just be dealing with it faithfully. Dealing with it biblically. Success would be defined by a willingness to sacrifice personal goals in order to obey the Lord's will. Suddenly, all of my plans, all of my, my plans for the day, the schedule, how much progress we're going to make, how much, you know, what's going to happen, all of that is completely able to be sacrificed for the sake of obeying the Lord. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's the definition of success. And then you multiply that day after day after day till it becomes a year, till it becomes 18 years or 22 years or whatever you have, that's success as determined by the fear of the Lord. We used to, we used to have a phrase, you know, when Paul says, well, we walk by faith, not by sight. We had a phrase in our, in our home, spanked by faith, not by sight. You say, oh, man, trying to correct, trying to be faithful. Trying, behaviors aren't changing. Nothing's happening. It's just, it's worthless. It's not producing the effects that I want. Well, what if obedience is simply what God wants? Isn't that enough? And then as they become older, oh, but now it's, what's going on? What's going on with their lives? What's going on in their hearts? You can't control that, but... If you fear the Lord, you're content to just simply be pleasing to the Lord and speak the powerful truth into their lives and love them. And certainly we have a lot that we could talk about by way of practical encouragements about how to do that, but the point of this seminar is just simply the foundation. No matter what you do, it will not be pleasing to the Lord if you do not fear the Lord in your own heart. That's the essence of parenting. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this rebuke. I know from my own heart, it's been so helpful and so needed. I, um, I just ask that as all of the parents in the room and all the grandparents in the room think about their own influence, I pray that they would not think about it from any selfish perspective, but they would think about it from this perspective, that we can, do, we can be no more loving to our children and grandchildren, to the other uh, young souls in this church, then we can simply love you and obey your commandments. Um, Lord, thank you for how practical and how relevant the fear of you is. Thank you for guiding us in it. Thank you for showing what it, us what it looks like. As we said at the very beginning, Lord, the fear of man is a snare, but those who fear you, those who trust you, will prosper. And so, Lord, the man-fearing is such a snare, and in parenting, it produces so many snares. We saw the snare of fearing man in the example of Eli and, and Samuel and David. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would benefit from that. I, I want to pray specifically if there's any who are burdened because they feel like, oh, I've, I've failed, I, I followed those examples in my own parenting. Um, I pray that they would just have the grace to confess that to their children, to make that right, to know that all's not lost, they can go back and Seek forgiveness and pursue a fear of you now. Even if children are out of the home, even if children are still in diapers, even if children are in high school, it doesn't matter, Lord. Uh, what, we, what we want is to see our, any area where we don't fear you exposed so that we can repent right now and please you in our parenting. Thank you so much for the power of your word, and we ask that you would apply it to our hearts this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.